doubled effort to include the American farmer as part of our process. Our new chief economist and our new director of education, Charles Conrad, who's here with me tonight, have promised me that they will invite close and frequent contact with the various farm organizations in settling the regulatory issues that come before us. They involve you, and you ought to be involved in them. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission wants no corners in the futures market. We want no squeezing of short hedgers. We will not allow the interests of speculative promotion to be placed above the need for stable and honest product pricing. We want no trading abuses. We want no contracts with unrealistic specifications or insufficient delivery points. There must be no special treatment for insiders at the exchanges. I make no personal claim to first-hand expertise in agriculture. My background is in the economics of finance. And it's been only seven months now that I've served on the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I'm still learning, but one thing I'm already certain of. Trading in agricultural futures must serve the need of the American farmer and the nation as a whole. If the system is to be judged as working, it must be working for you. Thank you. In conference there, and the president, in his opening remarks, said, during my campaign, I didn't promise the farmers and ranchers in this country that we would legislate farm markets that would reflect your costs of production with an incentive on it. He said, I did promise the farmers in this country one thing, and that is a farmer would be Secretary of Agriculture. And not only was that accomplished, but the Deputy Secretary as well is a farmer and rancher over the years being closely associated with agriculture. As a young man in high school, he earned the American Farmer's Degree. After World War II, he owned and operated a sawmill and logging operations. He ran his own mining business for some 13 years and then expanded his operation into cattle and citrus fruit operations. He served as Lieutenant Governor of the State of Florida for four years. Our speaker indeed is a cattle and citrus farmer. He was appointed Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture about a year ago. And Jim, I'd like to welcome you to our national convention. Jim. Williams, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Father, Mr. Vice President, distinguished treasurer, members of the organization. I'm going to apologize, which you are not supposed to ever do when you are involved in public speaking, but uh, I almost uh, feel compelled to tonight because as I worked on this talk and prepared it, and time was rather short, I had it in final form about 1 o'clock when I slipped down in the basement of the USDA building to to get uh, a little food, and when I got back, I had a couple of appointments. I grabbed up the file and came on the plane that was late and arrived here a while ago. And in reading through the remarks on the plane, it was going great until I reached to page seven, and that one was all right. And the eighth page sort of followed it. And then when I got to the conclusion in the ninth page, I found out they had run the seventh page again. And so I have a speech tonight in which the last page has been totally altered, and so I've now totally altered the speech. And for the press that's here, you have a rough road map of where I'm going. But where I'm going to try to get is through the text, and then share in the last few minutes that I'm with you uh, some personal remarks that I feel uh, compelled to offer here uh, this evening. In one month, I'll have been in Washington for a full year. And when I came to Washington last January the 15th to take on the job of Deputy Secretary, 
snow was on the ground and there were tractors in the snow. Well, last winter's snows are long gone now, and in fact, we may have snow there tonight before I get back tomorrow. But I think finally the last tractor has left them all. I thought I knew two things when I went to Washington. I thought I knew agriculture and government. But agriculture to me was citrus and cattle. And government for me was Florida government. I've learned a great deal in this past year. My inclination is to say that a lot has happened to American agriculture in 1979. But I think the real truth is that a lot has happened to the nation in 1979, and agricultural's influence has become apparent. Talk about the oil situation and inflation, for example, and you've got to talk about American agriculture. It's the one redeeming sector of the economy with a net contribution of $16 billion to the national balance of payments. Talk about productivity, and you've got to talk about American agriculture. Farm output per person is increasing faster than output in the non-farm sector. Talk about employment, and you've got to talk about American agriculture. Over 125 million tons in 1979, agricultural exports translate into 1.6 million U.S. workers in farm and non-farm employment. Or talk about world cooperation, and again, you've got to talk about American agriculture. The $4 billion in agricultural concessions achieved by the administration in the multilateral trade negotiations and that marks the first time that the nation's number one industry has been so recognized in this international forum. I've learned, learned a good deal about national agricultural statistics, and I'm tempted to talk about all the figures that look so good on the flow charts. 1979 net farm income was up. Cash receipts from sales of a record crop and near record livestock production up off-farm income up and continued soaring export growth and appreciated farmland values. But since I've been with this administration, I've learned something that goes beyond the statistics and the graphs and the flow charts. So if I were to tell you just good news about American agriculture, and there's much to be proud of, I'd do you a disservice, and I'd fall short of the leadership standards set by the administration. President Carter demands of himself and of us facts in context, a historical perspective, studied analysis, carefully deliberated, independently reached judgment. This is a novel, not a novel philosophy of government, but in the past it is one that has been sacrificed far too often to the polit politically expedient. When British statesman Edmund Burke was elected to the Parliament of the City of Bristol in 1774, he set out what he considered the relationship between a member of Parliament and his constituents. Certainly, gentlemen, Burke said, it ought to be the happiness and glory of a representative to live in the strictest union, the closest correspondence, and the most unreserved communication with his constituents. Their wishes ought to have great weight with him. Their opinion, high respect, their business should, re should receive unremitted attention. But, he adds, your representative owes you not just his industry, but his judgment. This year I've observed good government based on just such reasoned judgment. I have observed the effectiveness of a political philosophy that seeks the people's best interest first and popular claims second. President Carter has premised his entire administration on this kind of considered opinion and has carried it right through the current Iranian crisis. Bob Berglund told me that when he took office with President Carter, 
that President Carter envisioned nothing less than a total national and global food and agricultural policy. That the policy under Secretary Berglund and USDA is developed, and now it has stabilized the food and fiber supply. It's built export demand right into U.S. farm production system, and through the reserve system, we gave farmers the flexibility to step into export markets when prices were to their advantage, and farmers are doing that right now. Through November 20th, they had redeemed 435 million bushels of grain from the farmer-owned reserve. It's impossible to overestimate the importance of exports to farmers and to the national economy. We now export 33 percent of our corn, 40 percent of our soybeans, two-thirds of our wheat. It's largely because of this continuing growth in farm exports that crop prices have strengthened in the face of record production. These stronger prices, in turn, have bolstered income in 1979 for farmers. Agricultural exports hit $32 billion in 1979. We expect next year, 1979-80 fiscal year, to export $38 billion. That will be the 11th year in which both the volume and the value of exports have increased in this country. These export dollars are vital to offsetting our rapidly growing deficit in non-agricultural trade. We need to, to use those agricultural dollars to buy imports, especially oil, de demanded by our, our industrial society. Since 1973, the U.S. has increased its dependence on foreign oil by nearly 50%. We're now importing about 8 million barrels of foreign oil per day. I want you to know that the Carter administration understands that encouraging our farmers to increase their phenomenal export growth to pay for that oil is not enough. Our farmers and those who handle the market and market agricultural commodities cannot do it alone. We all must be supplied with critical inputs like transportation, energy, fertilizer. In the last decade, farm output per person hour has increased at about three times the rate of increase in non-farm industries. We want to help you keep up that rate of productivity increases into the 80s and beyond. I saw a cartoon recently called Dunnigan's People in which two blue-collar workers, lunch pails in hand, are going to work and one says to the other, if American productivity is on the decline with a normal work week, then it should decline slower with a shorter work week. Well, that uh, sounds a little strange, and yet uh, there are those probably who uh, believe it. You don't have the option of a shorter work week, and those in agricultural know that. Agricultural productivity may be on the rise, but it's not because farm workers are working shorter weeks. You work long hours because you're absolutely unwilling to give up farming as a way of life. We salute and applaud you. But with land production costs catching so many young farmers in a vicious cost price squeeze, applause isn't enough. We know that, and that's why we're trying to do something more. Bob Berglund, as you know, is now in the third week of 10 hearings across the nation on the structure of American agriculture. Our dialogue, and I'd be more precise to say your dialogue, because USDA is really providing the framework for nationwide comment, is not a policy statement. It is a statement of concern about trends within the American agriculture movement and a statement of willingness to change policy to change those trends if that is the national dictum, where we will still have the chance to do so. The Secretary's comments on the study reflect this administration's deliberate approach to a complex and many-faceted issue. Secretary Berglund has said that the study should, should prove unique in several ways. First, it will give us time, nearly two years before the Farm Bill of March 1981, to review, discuss, and debate in a studied rational atmosphere the forces that are shaping American agriculture. It will give us time to think things through, 
and time is not a luxury we are accustomed to in the passage of farm legislation. And second, it will be comprehensive in the range of questions that will be asked and the alternatives that will be considered. The structure study may lay groundwork for making conscious choices in a traditionally reactive agriculture. I can tell you tonight that no one in the hearings yet has come out against the family farm, but Secretary Berglund has also heard many different opinions of what constitutes the family farm problem. In Sioux City last week, for example, one witness said chronically low farm prices and low income aggravate all farm problems. Another speaker said the price of land is always too high and that only the government can help the farmer by controlling inflation. A third witness discussed the cultural values associated with small and moderate sized farms and the contributions that family values have made to the American character. Willis Rowell, on behalf of the NFO, said the structure study must center on the issue of land ownership. He expressed the NFO's concern about barriers to entry into farming and the impact on young people who want the time-honored chance to own and operate their own farms. I was pleased to hear Devon Woodland and the NFO leadership express this same concern to President Carter last week in the White House. I can assure you the President understands the plight of young farm couples and wants the many parts of the barriers problem defined so choices can be made. Soaring land values are a tremendous barrier to entry into farming. And you know that land prices have tripled since 1967, increasing at an average annual rate of 17 percent. I don't have to tell you that among parties bidding up the price of land are the large-scale farmer and the non-farm investor. I don't need to tell you that traditional government programs such as price support, tax and credit may no longer be serving their original purpose and may actually be working against the family farmer. That's why Secretary Berglund questioned Mr. Rowell and others so intensely on the degree to which the government should be involved in risk sharing. The Secretary asked what he called a very real question. How far should the government go in limiting risk sharing with large enterprises? In 1978, the commodity program's payments for example, came to $2,300,000. Because they're based on volume of production, these payments benefit big producers more than small. Only 10 percent of the farms participating in the programs got half the total payments. They were the largest farms. This administration appreciates the fact that the MF NFO does not look to government for guaranteed profit levels. We appreciate your participation in the structure hearings, interest in the family farmer, and your determination to give that same family farmer some power in the marketplace through collective bargaining. We recognize, as you do, that producing, marketing, and distributing farm products are different from producing and distributing other commodities in our economy. It is because of this belief, let me make it even stronger, this conviction that this administration is upholding the Capra Volstead Act without statutory modification. Now let me close by leading, reading you a letter from an, to the editor of the New York Times, and I quote, Dear Editor, the values of farm products have been destroyed. The great purchasing power, which is a measure of our national prosperity, has been so depleted that there is no hope for a return to normalcy until there has been a leveling down to the value of farm products or a lifting up of farm product values to the level of commodity prices. These are, there are thousands of farmers, he continues, in America who have grown good crops this year and have not earned a fair wage, have not earned enough to pay the interest on their mortgage and the taxes on their land. Agriculture, the greatest of all businesses, the one upon which this whole country depends for its prosperity is down and out, signed by John N. Dyer of Indiana. The dateline on that issue of the New York Times was Sunday, January the 1st, 1922. 
the same year that Senator Arthur Capper and Representative Andrew Volstead convinced fellow congressmen that farmers needed a mechanism to organize and improve their bargaining power. Nothing has changed. The economic imbalances persist. We believe that the advantages given farmers in 1922 are more important now than they have ever been to the survival of the family farm. I believe, as do President Carter, Vice President Mondale, and Secretary Berglund, the factors originally pointing up the need for the Capra Volstead Act still exist. Now, if I could add a few words of a personal note. I thank you for the opportunity of being one who serves in the Department of Agriculture in Washington. I've had a lot of jobs in my adult life, and by far the most rewarding experience in my work has come in the 11 years that I prefer to call public service. Six in the Florida Senate, four as Lieutenant Governor, a year as the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. There is no more rewarding experience for me than what I prefer to call public service. But that public service, in order for it to be rewarding, uh, leads me to a point of philosophy that I want to share with you. And the point I'll share it on is, uh, and use as an example, is the sixth anniversary of the OPEC embargo, which we just completed this November. Six years. Six years in which first President Nixon, then President Ford, and finally President Carter have tried to lead the people and the Congress to some decision, to a decision on energy, to eliminate the dependence that we have, to be more self-sufficient in the true spirit of America, free enterprise, and the independent spirit of Americans. And yet, after six years, the Congress is debating in committee in a conference that will be forthcoming shortly with some new initiative in energy. And I hope they conclude their work before they take their Christmas break and the recess before they come back in January. But I say to you, six years for this country not to have faced the threat of dependence on foreign oil is too long. And that leads me to the point of personal philosophy. I've enjoyed public service because there are, in my opinion, two schools of thought about our great country and its, its democratic representative form of government. Some still think that it's not a democratic representative form of government, but a pure democracy where everybody ultimately makes the decision. And everybody in today's society means polling the people back home and doing what a majority of the people think ought to be done. That's a legitimate way for those in elective office to serve. But fortunately for me, I was 40 when I finished college and 42 when I was elected to public office. And I'd spent a year running. And I sometimes thought I'd enjoyed the running more than the serving. And I was blessed with having the Asiatic flu between Christmas and New Year's in 1968. And I had a chance to think about public service and about a democratic representative form of government. And I concluded, there's no joy in public service if you simply take a poll back home and do what the majority do. The quote I referred to by Edmund Burke makes it very clear that my philosophy is that you have to act on the facts objectively that you gather. And when the decision is a tough one, you make it. And if it's not a popular decision, you go back home and explain to the people why you did it. And then you're honest enough with them to say, if that one vote was so bad that it no longer represents you and you no longer represent, want my representation in whatever job, then you have to vote me out at the next election. Now, a democratic representative form of government has to be, I believe, taking leadership roles where knowledge is there, 
and then educate the constituent you serve to that point of view. And if you're successful, remain in the job. If you're not, go home. I say to you that that is a minority philosophy in the halls of Congress, in the halls of your state legislature, perhaps even in the halls of your own city and county. But it's a reason that we haven't had an energy policy under three different presidents over the six-year period. Some issues cannot be debated to death. There are simply three ways government decides an issue. They vote yes, they vote no, or they don't do anything, and that's a no vote. This country needs strong leadership, not by poll taking, but by investigating the issues and going to the people with decisions. I commend uh, this organization for not just its 25 years, but for the caliber of input that I gained in sitting in that meeting with the president with your leadership last week. I enjoy public service. I enjoy everything I've ever done. This is the most rewarding experience in my political career. It may well be my last political appointment or office holding, but I can say to you, I've enjoyed every minute of the opportunity of serving my constituency, and now my constituency are all of you and the people of this country. For that, I will always be grateful. The concluding remark I share with you is that this is a family orientation. I'm a very happily married fellow. We just uh, celebrated last June on my 53rd uh, birthday, our 35th anniversary. And as I think back about World War II when we were married in 1944 and I was uh, celebrating my 18th birthday that day. As an only child, my parents must have been uh, very unusual people. Unfortunately, I lost both of them uh, while I was still in my 20s. But I remember vividly the trust they had and the confidence they had in me. I say to those of you that are younger than I am that marriage is a growing institution. 35 years is just a beginning for Lou and for me, but I'll tell you, it has not been 35 years without commitment, without nurturing that relationship, without strengthening it in a thousand different little ways. And if I were to try to counsel and advise in the presence of you, Father, to the young people, I'd say to them, don't be so overly concerned about the big decisions that you face in your family. Be concerned about the little everyday kind of things that you have to do. The sharing of information, the expression of love, and ultimately the total commitment to one another. Lou and I are blessed with three children. They're all in Florida. They're 22, 26, and the oldest will be 30 on the 18th of this month. And there's only one real sacrifice about being in Washington. We have our first grandbaby that's eight months old, and I must tell you, that's the only real problem with being so far from Florida in Washington, D.C. Because I must tell you, he is a very unusual grandchild. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought I had, was the only one that had the unusual grandchildren. We appreciate those who have been here with us this evening. Uh, we know that the Kansas City Kings have been uh, competitors for us tonight in a basketball game just across the street. Uh, we know who the basketball lovers are. They're there and we're here. And we'll take and recess our convention until in the morning at 10 o'clock. We encourage you to be here and in your seats early. We will start promptly.